Okay, so here we are now for the final two chapters of Anglin's Prisoners of Freedom, chapter seven and eight. So the, the chapter chapter seven, Human Rights and Moral Panics, listening to popular grievances, starts off with abducted school children's turned into bait for fish in the Indian Ocean that transformed sand into gold, which would enable the enrichment of leaders of poor countries whose children they would supply as bait and so on. England thinks we have to understand this kind of uh, panic rumor, moral panic, in the context of elitism and hierarchy that has left few channels for expressing discontent, at least to, uh, to the poor, rather than understanding this as flights into madness or something like um, along those lines. With that in mind, he suggests another interpretation. Quote, a moral panic reveals commonly felt frustrations. The moral panic of 2003 directs our in, uh, in, uh, attention to impoverished parents' desire to provide their children with quality education. He goes on to explain how the predominance of individual freedoms asserted in the human rights discourse of activists and politicians risked eclipsing the actual diversity of claims and concerns. Ethnographic witnessing uncovers in popular concerns intellectual resources, which in these circumstances might help give ears to the earless, that is, to help elites and activists to hear what people were really saying. He dispels the notion that moral panic is something like mass hysteria or mass psychosis. He says, because the subjects of a moral panic are able to analyze the causes of their distress and are adamant about the values they seek to defend. The 2003 moral panic in Chinsako, he goes on to say, arose out of rational concerns for the safety of their school children. For example, people may respond rationally to rumors that some entrepreneurs abduct children to harvest body parts for satanic rituals. This does not require those hearing the rumor to believe in Satanism, only that they believe that others may hold and act on satanic beliefs. As long as they have that notion in mind, then rumors about people abducting school children to use them in satanic rituals, gain a, a kind of urgency, a, a kind of immediacy. Anglin reminds us, his readers, that there is, after all, a transnational trade in human organs. So it, it's not as if this idea that people can be abducted or coerced or uh, in some way bamboozled into having their organs harvested is an outlandish idea. This is something that does actually happen. Whether it's happening in Chinsako at this time or not is a separate issue, but the notion that such a thing is possible is already well attested. So anyway, um, further then, that a significant portion of, that, of the trade in human organs is criminal in nature. It's not all done by the donor cards you fill out when you get your driver's license. There's an act of criminal trade in organs as well. So then rumors, he says, only appear plausible if they are adapted to local landscapes and relationships and, he goes on to say, find their force in the lived experiences of those who believe them. So the companion piece to this may be then that Rumors that meet these criteria then are also extremely difficult simply to ignore. There's the sense that if you ignore them, you ignore them at your peril. And so you can't simply dismiss them. Human rights organizations, on the other hand, demonstrated a failure to attune themselves to popular concerns in their rush to condemn outbursts of violence by some who believed the rumors as simply mob justice, even while there had recently been 
this spate of murders and disfigurements of women. So again, these um, acts of mob justice, they occur within a specific context. And what England is urging us to do is not respond with a kind of uh, blanket response as if it could apply to all situations, but rather to pay attention to the specific details of the situation at hand. What's going on there and how does that help us understand why people are engaged in what these um, human rights organizations condemn as mob justice. Um, oh, he also, that's in the wrong order, my apologies. So he also emphasizes that the rumors in the Longue appear to arise in response to a transnational division of labor. So there's also an historical component of this. And in that history, Malawians have served as labor to enrich others. For example, working in mines in Southern Africa. So that the transnational aspect of this trade in bodies is also something that is already familiar to people in Malawi. Notably, those most closely touched by the rumors, when he went on to talk to them later on, did not describe them as rumors, but rather as news, as something that had happened and been witnessed. They assigned to them a kind of facticity, in other words, that they didn't have the status of something that might have happened. The reality for them was that these were things that had happened. They knew people who knew people who maybe knew people who had seen or heard something. England stresses, therefore, that it's important to understand the conditions that made the stories so compelling. Again, we could hear rumors of the type, say, of celebrity gossip that don't have any immediate consequences for us. And we can find them entertaining, perhaps, but we don't really need to take them seriously. That's not the nature of rumor here. Here, the nature of rumor is something that could have dire consequences that you cannot simply dismiss out of hand as nonsense or fanciful. Chief among these conditions, then, was the utter inadequacy of public education. And this ranged from having uh, teachers who were unqualified, uh, who were embedded in scandals, uh, to schools and teachers that were overwhelmed by massive student enrollment, uh, so great that they sometimes did not have room inside the schools to hold classes because there were simply too many students and they would commonly simply hold class outside because that was the only place where there was space for that many students. Further, there is a public-private divide in schooling and uh, often there were thefts from the public schools occasionally to serve the private school, so that people would steal textbooks or, or other resources. And along with that, then, was a sentiment that security at public schools was, was just simply inadequate. So there's this whole combination of things that contribute to an environment in which stories of children being abducted to be cut into fish bait have surprising plausibility. He says, it was as if the rumors about life-threatening abductions gave form to grievances. So then, the further dimension of this is that <clears throat> it's not just that there are elements that may make these stories seem plausible, but also that they are knit into ongoing anxieties and grievances and dissatisfactions with the availability of schooling, uh, proper instruction, and adequate security at the schools. During the 2003 Moro Panic, some came to believe then that a local businessman was involved in the abduction of children because he owned a fridge. The, the idea being that because he owned a fridge, he could uh, harvest 
the bodies, the, the children's bodies, and keep them fresh in the fridge until they were exported to the uh, foreign recipients who were paying top dollar for this so that they could then use them as bait and so on. So then they go as a group to confront him in his house. The police have, uh, have come to his house. At one point, they take him into custody, but then find nothing to indicate that he has been involved in this trade. And so they release him. But what they wind up doing then is protecting him in his home <clears throat> from the group gathered outside so that the police become positioned in a way here as if aligned with this fellow who they who the, the group thinks is a perpetrator of child abduction and, um, well, murder. Now, what this does then in the minds of the group is confirm their suspicions that this entrepreneur is guilty and the complicity of the police, while simultaneously casting into doubt the reliability of human rights NGOs that condemn their actions as mob justice rather than, say, condemning the actions of this entrepreneur who they think is abducting children. The notion of mob justice in these circumstances then serves to obscure poor Malawian grievances. So it's a way of turning a deaf ear to the undercurrents beneath this group mobilization and their reasons born of long experience for not trusting the police. An aspect of mob justice that NGOs might have missed is that in villages, vigilante groups were often the instrument, if not of justice exactly, at least punishment. But they weren't just uncontrolled mobs roaming around looking for people to, to rough up. Rather, they were overseen by local elected bodies. So there was some accountability there. Mob justice was, in such cases, in fact, organized and sanctioned. So it didn't have this element of kind of collective madness or collective psychosis that the moniker mob justice would seem to, to give them. Whereas civic educators would presume that police and courts offer justice, the experience of villagers were often the opposite, that the police appeared as the agents protecting the rich and powerful from justice at the expense of the poor. Civic educators and the CHRR in these circumstances aligned themselves with the police then demanding public compliance with the police. And of course, this just emphasized the lack of familiarity that NGOs had with the realities of poor Malawians insecurity. He goes on to say, in other words, while activists were fully aware of the problems in the police force, their civic education proceeded from the assumption that the police could be entrusted with the investigation of cases in which poor Malawians had been the victims, witnesses to the bias of police toward the rich and powerful, who sometimes doubled as the mastermind behind crime, ordinary Malawians had learned to expect little justice from the institutions promoted by civic educators. Crippled in turn by their elitist assumption that the poor were prone to violence and easily excitable, civic educators were unable to listen properly to proper grievances. England explains that we must understand Chinsapo residents' distrust of police, political leaders, some, and some entrepreneurs, and the mob justice they undertook against the backdrop of the kind of trust that is characteristic of their everyday lives, in the form, for example, of offering credit, making good on debts, treating creditors and debitors and debtors alike with courtesy and patience. That is, there is here a kind of moral economy that they're already engaged with. 
considering the centrality of Venden in for for so many in Chitsapo, that is, so many people were engaged in vending. The sorts of anxieties associated with it, given their precarious financial conditions. It's not really surprising then that rumors about abducting children for body parts would also adopt the idiom of vending, right? It's it's such a central feature of their lives that it makes a certain kind of sense that that would be the kind of familiar idiom on which they would draw. Now, the fact that vending reproduced the sorts of dramatic inequality that England has already discussed really throughout the book is why he calls it an immoral economy. That is to say, it's an economy that maintains this kind of inequality as a sort of a staple of people's lives. But he shows that it is shot through with moral behavior, this stuff like making good on your debts, extending trust, and so forth. Extending trust, but also extending a certain amount of grace to people who are not yet able to pay back their debts. And so all of this, giving and receiving credit, entrusting one another to both to offer credit and to pay back one's debt. All of this occurs then within the, these very perilous economic circumstances. And so the investment of trust is, is a very serious matter and it is therefore uh, has moral dimensions to it. England points not to the individual statuses involved like creditor and debtor, but rather to the relationships that they allow and how trust on both sides is what keeps the relationship viable. And indeed, the point is to maintain the relationships, to keep them going, so that there is uh, an investment in a moral arrangement as well as an economic arrangement, that people become tied to one another through these. So then, Freedom here grows out of, he says, a range of deliberate dependencies. Freedom is not freedom from dependencies, but rather these deliberate dependencies are exactly the earth out of which freedom grows. This is not at all what the discourse on human rights looks like as it comes through the activists that claim rights or individual freedoms, as if their transactions could be sustained by mutual strangers. Instead, England goes on, debt-generated relationships in which people owed one another not only money and goods, but also the morally bi binding pledge to stay loyal to the relationship. When rumors then circulated about the trade in body parts, it seemed to Chinsapo townspeople like a grotesque inversion of the moral dimensions of trade that constituted their livelihoods. It, it was a, via, a, a violation of their most deeply held moral sensibilities and relationships. Mob justice and moral panic grew out of that feeling that their fundamental values were under attack. But then it also recalled Malawi's unequal place in the world. So then it's not simply uh, a reckoning with local experiences, but rather local experiences within a transnational setting, a transnational history. And this is a place in which Malawian bodies were available for transnational trade and exploitation. The reality of transnational governance made, in turn, human rights activists' claims that rights were the attributes of individuals seem implausible in, in popular perspectives. The alternative vision, not that individuals possess freedom, but that freedom depends on one's relationships with others, seemed more compelling on the one hand to, to uh, the, the people who are making these assessments, but it also helps to explain how moral panic can spring from the feeling 
that those relations have been violated. Now we get to the final chakra. I want to pause here just for a moment um, to, to, to say that this final chapter to me is a model of what a concluding chapter should look like. It does, uh, I think, just a masterful job of bringing in the different lines of argumentation and the different sorts of evidence that he's laid out through the rest of the book, exploring how they connect to one another and clearly articulating what the project of the book has been throughout. So we'll start there. He says, this book has shown how human rights discourse compels careful consideration of who has the authority to participate in it. We'll remember that in things like civic education settings, not everybody had an equal voice in the discourse on human rights or democracy for that matter. Not everyone could participate in it. There, was, there were clear distinctions of status and her. Anyway, he goes on. The idea of cultural discreteness appears insidious when it obscures, among other things, the transnational economic and political processes by which African activists and their foreign donors agree on a particular definition of human rights. The issue is to, to devise ways in which negation and contest can be made explicit and inclusive. Now, we should remember at this point that one of the points that he's made several times through the book is that uh, villagers receiving civic education, um, people who have gone to legal aid, do voice dissent. That is their exercise of freedom, exercised within specifiable, concrete circumstances. Right? He can give a description to what those circumstances are and why they therefore express their dissent or insist on their view of things the way that they do and um, in within the, the particular confines that they experience. He recalls how translation, discussed back in chapter 2, revealed what can happen if the power to define human rights is exclusive, inimical to a recognition of multiple interests in situations in which the rights are evoked. Again, he keeps coming back to this, that rights are evoked in specific situations, and that in order to understand what human rights are, how they're meaningful at all, we have to at first be attentive to those situations. That's the only way that we're really going to get a sense of how it is that people understand and put into practice human rights, or um, in the alternative, how a failure to attend to those situations makes the advocacy of human rights in the abstract more of a problem than a solution. He also, however, points to other ways that Malawians air their grievances, as in the way that moral panic and mob justice stemmed from perceived attacks on fundamental values to which human rights activists remained blind. He explains this by way of a refrain running through the book. Human rights discourse on its own cannot deliver substantive democracy, at very least because its universalism may conceal particular interests like status, hierarchy, elitism, and structural inequalities. And so then, as long as it's concealing those things, there's no meaningful way to address them. Even as they critique the elitism of specific politicians, activists, he point out, points out, generally bear elitist aspirations of their own. And we see this in officers and in volunteers as well. And that that pursuit of elitist aspirations pits them it's their interests, that is, against the grassroots or against uh, clients seeking legal aid, um, either in the context of educating them about human rights or in the context of the legal clinic. 
in response to activists' inability to take note of the obstacles and aspirations that characterize most Malawians' lives, England positions the book like this. He says, The task of this book is less to imagine alternative democracies than to demonstrate why such alternatives are necessary in the first place, and where the intellectual resources for their imagining might be found. That is to say, not among human rights and democracy activists, but rather, if we listen carefully, in the moments of freedom and protest that we get from the grassroots, from villagers, from the poor, from workers. England is clear that he does not see a conspiracy. This is not an accusation that he's leveling. He's not leveling an accusation of conspiracy to disempower the poor. That's not how he sees governmentality or governance to work. The story he tells has to do instead with how human rights activists self-regulated as certain kinds of subjects, that is, the work of governmentality works on the activists themselves, not simply the activists imposing kind of governance on villagers. So then, as certain kinds of subjects, and bearers of status and expertise, for example, and what consequences for themselves and others grew out of that self-regulation, right? that sort of uh, embrace of governmentality. As activists self-regulated, though, they did, not, they did so not just with reference to elitism in Malawi. So these are concerns, right? The local concerns of status, hierarchy, elitism, these are conditioning features of self-regulation, yes, but they're not the only ones. They're also informed by notions of rights and the right-bearing individual meaning that they responded to a transnational mode of governance, i.e. the donors, the donor um, institutions, broader networks of human rights organizations, and so forth. International donors, therefore, had a powerful role in setting priorities and policies for Malawian activists along neoliberal lines. So that status and hierarchy are part of their self-regulation, but the neoliberal picture of the subject is also part of their self-regulation. Crucially, donors' neoliberal imperatives aligned well with entrenched inequalities in Malawi with complex repercussions. He writes, as self-regulating subjects, civic educators imagine in their patterns of consumption, hygiene, language use, the grounds of their cultural and intellectual uh, supremacy, all vital subjective enhancements of their self-esteem in the context of an educational and economic crisis. Their contempt for the fact that human rights could assume meaning only in concrete situations is common in a humanitarian regime that builds its approach on a concept of abstract and universal humanity. Again, this is a refrain that has run through virtually the entire book. A damaging, that should be a damaging, not an damaging, excuse me, a damaging implication of this uh, neoliberal model was the way it implicitly made the poor responsible for their own poverty, as we saw with the demands for their participation, to volunteer their labor. Englund states that the task of his book is not to evaluate NGOs in Malawi, but to provide, he says, intellectual resources for thinking beyond the particular human rights discourse that has captured the imagination of Malawian activists and their foreign donors. His main focus is on the notion of freedom. Not coincidentally, it is in the title after all. And then the possibilities to consider it beyond its neoliberal version, which is to say 
the neoliberal version of freedom might be the dominant notion of freedom in circulation, but it is not the only one. He says, the need is to reclaim freedom from its abuse in neoliberal projects, which carry, in many parts of Africa, uncanny similarities to the late colonial orders of exclusion and exploitation. If freedom is not a permanent condition to be achieved, again, he's recalling here his uh, invocation of Foucault's later work here, where, where Foucault discusses freedom in this sense, of not as something to be achieved, but is rather discontinuous and precarious, then the crucial question is how persons can exercise it in their situations. Once again, his insistence on the situatedness of action, of freedom, of the employment of human rights, of the practices of democracy, and so forth. Freedom in this view cannot be reduced to individual choice, as in the neoliberal view. And this is something he explored in Chapter 7 on, um, on moral panic. In given situations, the exercise of choice occurs by subjects in relations of debt, obligation, entitlement, and so forth. So not as autonomous individuals in abstract communities, but as individuals whose subjectivity is shaped in the relationships of debt, obligation, entitlement, and so on. Thus, England concludes that this study attempts to unchain the minds of those who became the prisoners of a specific kind of freedom while retaining the idea of freedom for alternative projects of socioeconomic transformation. This does not amount, in his view, to the need to abandon liberalism entirely, especially those offshoots that defend ideas of social justice and equality, which may yet lend themselves to radical political projects. Rather, he holds the view that, seen in a certain light, we cannot easily characterize Malawi as a failure, a dem democratic failure in particular. Rather, it looks like a neoliberal success story of democratization. The problem, however, is that such a view does not acknowledge, indeed it makes it difficult to see, that rights to participate in neoliberal democracy, in fact, not, do not even contest, much less alter the socioeconomic inequalities that maintain poverty and political mar marginalization of the poor. He concludes with the thought that it is not the case that vill villagers receiving education, civic education or workers seeking help through legal aid are incapable of understanding and articulating the threats that are of a most immediate concern to their viability. The point he makes is that the notions of human rights and democracy circulating among politicians and activists are most directly relevant to their interests, not to those who they aim to educate and to advise. A starting point to remedy this, he thinks, is to become attentive to the actual situations in which people live and to which people therefore, uh, in, and in which therefore, issues of human rights might arise.